Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Chris Beers. Here are today's top stories. Cutting funding for a hospital over a candle. A Catholic hospital in Oklahoma won a dispute with the federal government over a certain religious practice. Dishwashers take center stage as the Biden administration looks to take on climate change. The popular appliance is the latest gadget to feel the wrath of carbon reduction efforts. The European Commission president marks Europe Day with a trip to Ukraine. Meanwhile, on Moscow's Red Square, Russian leader Vladimir Putin delivers a fiery speech. NTD's first global Chinese beauty pageant has a mission to celebrate natural beauty and spread traditional Chinese values. We'll hear from the pageant's advisors on the mission. Former President Donald Trump is set to appear tomorrow at a CNN presidential town hall in New Hampshire. However, he issued a word of caution about what might happen. Trump wrote on Truth Social that CNN made him a deal that he couldn't refuse, adding it could be the beginning of a new and vibrant CNN with no more fake news or it could turn into a disaster for all. Trump didn't elaborate on what deal was struck with CNN, but the network has been highly critical of the former president, both while and after he was in office. A Catholic hospital in Oklahoma is celebrating after being allowed to keep practicing its faith. The federal government tried to impose new rules and even threatened funding cuts. Here are the details. A government agency reportedly told the St. Francis Catholic Hospital System in Oklahoma it will lose accreditation for Medicaid and Medicare if it doesn't remove an eternal flame from its chapels. A member of the hospital's legal team told Fox News, It was shocking. I've been doing religious liberty work for a long time, and I was shocked. It's one thing to say you have a candle here. Let's work on it. It's another thing to say that the people who need care won't be able to get it because you have a living flame in your sanctuary. The flame is central to their faith, so the hospital system refused to let it go. The hospital then sent a letter to Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra. They said the Biden administration was violating First Amendment rights and religious beliefs, writing, We are writing to ask you to cease and desist before we file an emergency lawsuit naming you as defendants and seeking emergency relief and substantial damages. If we go to court, you will lose. I write in the hope that you will see reason, or at least the law, and we can skip to the easy part. The dispute was dropped after a meeting between St. Francis representatives and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The centers wrote this letter to the hospital after the meeting, saying, We believe today's discussion and agreed-upon solution enables St. Francis South Hospital to maintain a living flame in the hospital chapel while mitigating fire risks. The hospital now has to post signage to notify people of the existence of the flame. The eternal flame symbolizes the presence of Christ and is an important part of their worship. The health system reportedly said cutting off Medicare and Medicaid would have caused irreparable financial loss to their institutions. The Biden administration is taking aim at dishwashers to tackle climate change. This follows its move against gas stoves earlier in the year. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the details of the new proposal. The Department of Energy recently proposed congressionally mandated standards for new dishwashers. They call for separate new efficiency rules for power and water usage. The proposal seeks to cut energy use by almost 30 percent and water use by nearly 35 percent in new dishwashers. Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm says, This administration is using all of the tools at our disposal to save Americans money while promoting innovations that will reduce carbon pollution and combat the climate crisis. If all goes according to plan, the new rules would come into effect in 2027. The DOE estimates the new regulations would save consumers nearly $3 billion in utility bills over 30 years. The proposed standards represent the toughest clampdown on dishwasher efficiency rules in a decade. Gas stoves were in the spotlight earlier in the year. The DOE proposed a rule in February that could effectively take many gas stoves off the market. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis reacted. You're not taking our gas stoves away from us. DeSantis even took some steps to protect the appliances in Florida. No tax permanently on gas stoves. They want your gas stove, and we're not going to let that happen. Democrat Governor Kathy Hochul signed a law banning gas stoves from most new buildings in New York early this month. 
Congressman Nick LaLota called the New York gas stove ban government gone wild on Fox News. We have the highest tax burden of any of the 50 states. Yeah. And this new policy on top of the bail reform policy is another reason why New Yorkers are a little less proud. Electric motors and beverage vending machines also have new proposed requirements. The DOE says the moves will reduce carbon emissions by a combined 95 million metric tons over 30 years. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Optimism for U.S. small businesses fell last month. This is amid high inflation and a shortage of workers. What are some of Main Street's top concerns? Here's more from NTD Business's Don Ma. All right, thanks, Chris. U.S. small business optimism fell to the lowest level in a decade last month. Now, this is according to a business optimism index by the National Federation of Independent Business. So here to talk to me about the index is Holly Wade, executive director of NFIB's Research Center. Now, Holly, I guess the most important question I should ask is, are small businesses making money, right, according to the index? <laughs> Yes. So according to the index, small business optimism has deteriorated from March to April. They're making money. Sales have held up okay over the last uh, few months. However, inflation is eating into those earnings. Increased compensation is in eating into those earnings. And so they're struggling to pass along those costs and remain competitive in this environment. So inflation, unfortunately, is still part of the equation and it's really impacting those small businesses. Now, is that, is that the biggest reason that small businesses are concerned about? Is that the top reason or among the top reasons? It's one of the two. So the two largest concerns of small business owners currently about a quarter of them are saying their top concern is inflation, and another quarter of them are saying that labor quality or the tight labor market is their top concern. So those have been the two for really about the last year or so that have been the biggest challenges for small business owners in operating their business. Are businesses spending on investment or expanding operations? So capital spending has increased a bit over the last few months. And so that seems to be relatively okay or stable. So they are spending money when they need to related to you know new equipment, replacing furniture, those sorts of things. But when we ask them about expansion, if it's a good time to expand, very few are saying expansion opportunities or that the current environment is is helpful for expanding, mostly because of not being able to hire or fill those positions that they currently have. And so expansion opportunities are fairly limited. But where they can make improvements, where they can streamline operations as far as purchasing equipment, they are doing that. I see. So in terms of expansion, does that have to do with more on the labor side or credit conditions? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. So likely it has more to do with the labor side, not being able to um, increase those uh, uh, supply. To, you know, a lot of small businesses are still reporting that they have supply chain issues. And so that's also an impediment to expansion. Credit conditions, while few more are saying that it is more difficult, it doesn't seem to be a a, a significant problem for small businesses right now. They are saying that they're having to pay more, certainly for financing with the increase in interest rates. But as far as availability, that doesn't seem to be kind of a top concern um, at the moment. So that's good news for the small business sector. All right, Holly, maybe just one more question. You know, with the Fed raising interest rates and the recent banking turmoil, how does all this play into small businesses? Certainly. So we just released last week a banking survey of small business owners asking them specifically about how they're banking, if they've talked to their bank. And they are concerned about the stability of the banking system. Many of them have talked with their banker who they have business 
relationships with, and many of them said that their bank has reached out to them. While they haven't switched banks or have changed operations in that area um, significantly, they are concerned, and that is having an impact on kind of optimism going forward. All right, thanks, Holly. Pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. The NFIB Research Center has collected small business economic trends data with quarterly surveys since the fourth quarter of 1973 and monthly surveys since 1986. Survey respondents are randomly drawn from NFIB's membership. Back to you, Chris. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on Sunday issued a stark warning on the debt ceiling. She says that a failure by Congress to act could trigger a constitutional crisis. I wanted to find out what that means, so I spoke with Vance Ginn, senior fellow at Americans for Tax Reform and former chief economist of the White House's Office of Management and Budget. Vance Ginn, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So why is Yellen saying cons- Congress's failure to act um, could trigger a constitutional crisis? Well, you know, Jenny Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, and President Biden, and the Senate Democrats, they don't want to come together with the House Republicans who have already passed a debt ceiling bill that would raise the debt ceiling for about a year, about $1.5 trillion, um, remove some of government spending going back to the 2022 levels, um, you rein in the growth of government to 1% over time, trying to provide a pro-growth path forward to really rein in this. And so Janet Yellen's out there now saying, well, look, this is a constitutional crisis. This is something we've got to deal with the 14th Amendment. And to me, it's just another way for them to pivot, to the, for them to point fingers at others whenever they don't want to come to the deal to make a deal overall. Because right now, you know, look, I'm wearing a red tie today. This happened to be where we're running through red ink by too much government spending. We've got to get our house in order. If not, we're going to see higher inflation, higher interest rates, and more burdens on the American people. Do you think the 14th Amendment actually gives Janet Yellen the right to um, you know, declare the debt ceiling unconstitutional? Well, look, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm an economist. And ultimately, there may be a path for them to do that, but I don't think so. I think the debt ceiling is important. The debt ceiling forces these sort of discussions to happen for us to figure out what are the proper roles for government? How much should we be spending? How much should we be taxing in the process? And this is an important part of that process. You know, states are doing this all across the country where they have to balance their budget. They have balanced budget requirements. You and I have to balance our own budgets. The federal government should be too. And unfortunately, we're in a situation where we have 31.4 trillion plus national debt. We've got a foreseeable future of $2 trillion just each year in deficits because of excessive government spending. We've got to rein in government spending first, and a lot of this other stuff will work itself out over time, which a big part of this too will be more economic growth. If they keep going down this path and don't rein in government spending, don't rein in the deficit and debt, we're going to have slower economic growth and more poverty in the process. So what are some of the other options uh, aside from invoking the 14th Amendment to deal with the debt ceiling crisis? I think it goes back to government spending. I mean, I think that the, the House Republicans have put out a good deal out there right now and saying, look, let's go back to the 2022 levels. I think some of us, I would like to see us go back to 2019, even before the pandemic and all of the expenditures that went out over that period of time. But a good deal to at least get started in that direction is going back to the 2022 levels. And what that means is that, you know, we're in 2023 fiscal year now, they would go back to the year before. And then they would slow the growth of spending to just 1% over the next decade. They would also get rid of some bad um, tax breaks for green energy sources like wind and solar, which are unreliable. There would be some other bad policies that would be taken out of this as well that have happened over the last year, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is highly costly for the American people. And put us on a better trajectory for more growth, less government spending, and, and what I think is a more sustainable future for us to have not as much in national debt, not as high of interest rates, and not high, as high inflation. We're all getting killed by this inflation, higher interest rates right now. This is a good path. And President Biden and the Senate Democrats need to come to the table and figure something out because the path of higher taxes and more government spending hasn't worked and it won't work. So let's look at the worst case scenario. What happens if Congress can't agree and there's no other measures and the U.S. defaults, essentially? 
I hope we don't get to that point. You know, I know Jenny Yellen has said by early June, if something is not done, a debt ceiling bill is not passed, that we could hit the debt ceiling. What that means is that we couldn't pay for some of our debt that's going to be rolling over and need to be paid for, maturing, if you will. And so that could lead to a debt crisis, a debt default, which would which interest rates would soar. Uh, we would see a lot of of distortions, um, other sort of problems throughout the economy and internationally as well as fewer people who want to buy dollars in the process. And so we don't want to hit that point. And this is why I think it's so important. Look, the, we had an election just last year and there were some changes that were made based on that election, giving the Republicans the majority in the House. And now they're doing what I think what the people wanted is to say, look, we've got to rein in this excessive, irresponsible government spending over time. What we really need to do is get back to responsible spending and stop spending all these taxpayer dollars, leave more money in the productive private sector. And we will have more economic growth, which is ultimately what we need in this stagnant, you know, stagnation, stagflationary period that we're currently in. Vance Ginn, Senior Fellow at Americans for Tax Reform. Thank you. Thank you so much. A new poll finds Americans aren't confident its leaders can lead the economy in the right direction. According to a new Gallup survey, nearly half of Americans have almost no confidence in President Joe Biden's ability to do or recommend the right thing for the economy. Just 35 percent of people have a great deal or fair amount of confidence in him. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell doesn't fare any better. Only 36 percent of Americans have confidence in him on the economy, with 28 percent saying they have almost no confidence. And when it comes to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, just 37 percent have a great deal or fair amount of confidence in her. A California tech CEO's remains have been discovered almost a year and a half after he went missing. His remains were found about a mile from where his Uber driver supposedly dropped him off. Bo Mann founded tech company SoberGrid in 2015. The firm is designed to support people trying to break free from substance abuse. The SoberGrid app provided 20, provides 24-7 access to support. A statement from SoberGrid says Mann texted 911 while inside an Uber, but was never heard from again. He was supposedly dropped off in Santa Monica. His remains were found in a courtyard near an abandoned building. Authorities are trying to find out why he died. With crime surging in Washington, D.C., Mayor Muriel Bowser is considering adding more police. Bowser says police staffing levels are at a historic low. She plans to host a public safety summit on Wednesday to get feedback from the public on the best way forward to, de to deal with the crime. Violent crime is up 10% from last year in the city, including a 15% rise in murders. Violent crime committed by juveniles is also up. This has caused some residents to call for their prosecution as adults. Meanwhile, police statistics show sex abuse cases are up nearly 50% and robberies up over 10%. North Dakota has a new law that will allow teachers and school officials to ignore a student's preferred pronoun. Governor Doug Burgum signed the bill on Monday, although it already passed the legislature with a veto-proof majority. It also bans hiding a student's transgender status from their parents and prohibits students from utilizing a restroom that does not correspond to their biological sex. Supporters say it strengthens parental rights and protects girls' restrooms, Opponents say it forces teachers to out LGBT students or parents, guardians who may not be approving. A man who helped Olympic athletes obtain performance-enhancing drugs pleads guilty. He was the first person charged under a recent anti-doping law. Eric Lira was accused of supplying drugs to athletes competing in the Tokyo Olympics, including Nigerian sprinter Blessing Okabari. The Rodchenkov Act allows criminal charges against doping conspirators at events involving U.S. athletes, broadcasters, and, and sponsors. Lira previously pleaded not guilty. He could face as much as 10 years in prison, but will likely get less under his new guilty plea agreement. Okabari is currently serving an 11-year ban for multiple breaches of anti-doping rules and refusing to cooperate with investigators. The 33-year-old was due to run in semifinal races at the, at the Tokyo Olympics before being suspended. Up next, Mexico is intercepting ingredients for fentanyl at ports. Authorities say the supply for the deadly opioid is coming from China.
performance that truly matters. For each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. The Fixture Pioneer, CGM. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. Two micrometer repetition accuracy. More than 80 patent certificates. ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Welcome back. Fentanyl kills tens of thousands of U.S. citizens every year, with much of it coming across the southern border. Mexican authorities are now seizing ingredients for the opioid, which are shipped from China. Here's the story. Authorities are seizing packages containing fentanyl from China at a Mexican port. The country's president saying he would ask China to help stop the drug's flow. The packages mainly contain the precursor chemicals used to make the synthetic opioid. Those that aren't seized could be made into pills and smuggled into the U.S. through the southern border. Last year, U.S. authorities confiscated over 300 million doses of fentanyl, enough to kill the entire U.S. population. In 2021 alone, the drugs killed over 70,000 Americans. That's about one person every eight minutes. To put it in perspective, fentanyl has killed more Americans than car accidents and cancer. Those deaths are breaking parents' hearts across the country. In Texas, a father lost his 15-year-old son to fentanyl. He was murdered by a, a drug dealer selling counterfeit Percocet pills. <sighs> the pill he took contained eight milligrams of fentanyl, which is four times the lethal, lethal dose. Over in Michigan, a mother lost two sons to fentanyl poisoning. Well, I'll tell you, in the support groups, you know, there's, there have been some parents who have committed suicide, um, siblings who have. Um, it's devastating families. It's been very difficult for my daughters. She's calling on more to be done to stop fentanyl at its source. Now, if we had Chinese troops lining up along our southern border, with weapons aimed at our people, with weapons of mass destruction aimed at our cities, you damn well know you would do something about it. But 100,000 die every year and nothing's being done. Not enough is being done. Numbers are going up, not down. And you talk about children being taken away from their parents. My children were taken away from me. <laughs> A hundred thousand Americans every year are having their children, 200,000 because it's both parents, right? Are having their children taken away from them. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland is calling on Beijing to stop the flow of fentanyl chemicals. The Chinese regime halted cooperation with foreign countries on fighting fentanyl last year. That's after former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, angering the Chinese regime. Beijing denies China to Mexico fentanyl trafficking. A foreign ministry spokesperson said the fentanyl crisis in the U.S. was a problem, quote, completely made in the USA. Deadly overdoses from fentanyl have surged in recent years, and not just for adults. New research shows deaths among children have increased significantly. The number of children and teens who died from fentanyl overdoses increased 30-fold from 2013 to 2021. That's according to data published on Mon Monday in the journal JAMA Pediatrics. More than 5,000 children died from overdoses involving fentanyl in the last 20 years. And half of those deaths happened during the first two years of the pandemic. 
The vast majority of the pediatric deaths from fentanyl are among teens aged 15 to 19. The Biden administration wants to maintain the status quo with China. The State Department reiterates its China policy despite the Secretary of State's China trip cancellation. There has been no change to uh, our policy with China. There has been no change to our one China policy, which is guided by, uh, by more than four decades of the Taiwan Relations Act. You heard the secretary talk about this uh, just last week when he um, sat down for Washington Post Live. Uh, he <clears throat> would like to go. He would like to get this trip uh, uh, back on uh, and will intend and work to do so when conditions allow. He added that continued communication would benefit both countries. His comments follow remarks by the Chinese foreign minister who accused the U.S. of erroneous words and deeds, which threw ties back into a deep freeze. The Chinese foreign minister met with U.S. Ambassador Nicholas Burns in Beijing and stressed the communist regime's views on the Taiwan issue. The relationship between the world's two biggest economies sank to a low last year when then-Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi paid an official yet routine visit to democratically governed Taiwan. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. Coming up, scientists in China announce a breakthrough. They've managed to make a monkey control a machine with only brain waves. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has arrived in Kyiv to mark Europe Day. Ukraine has adopted the date as its own, highlighting its ambition to join Western institutions. Our efforts for a united Europe for security and peace need to be as strong as Russia's desire to destroy our security, our freedom, our Europe. Ukraine has resisted the attack and is fighting back successfully. And why that? First and foremost, because as a free society, Ukraine can count on the unquenchable bravery of its million women and men. The comments were made at a joint press conference. Von der Leyen said the EU will up munition production to meet the needs of Ukraine and member states. President Zelensky thanked Europe for its military assistance in the war. He said as of today, Russia had failed to capture the eastern city of Bakhmut. Zelensky said he expects the EU to impose a new set of sanctions on Russia and said the measures should target Russia's atomic energy sector. Ukraine applied for EU membership last year. Zelensky said he expects the EU summit in June to yield a positive evaluation of that process. On the other side of the border, Moscow was marking the anniversary of its World War II victory over Nazi Germany. Russian President Vladimir Putin said the West is waging a real war against Russia. Today, civilization is once again at a crucial turning point. A real war has once again been unleashed against our homeland. But we have fought back against international terrorism. We will also protect the people of the Donbas and ensure our security. Putin said the Ukrainian people have become hostages to what he called a state coup. He blamed the so-called Western globalist elites for sowing Russophobia and aggressive nationalism. Putin didn't address the challenges Moscow is facing. Russian forces are now bracing for a major counteroffensive by Ukraine. Now on to some science and technology developments. Chinese scientists say they've hooked up a monkey to a machine which can control only using thoughts. A technological breakthrough or a violation of ethics? Chinese scientists at Nankai University shared a discovery on Thursday, saying they successfully completed the world's first interventional brain-computer interface experiment, or BCI, on non-human primates. The largely experimental technology allows a living being, in this case a monkey, to control machines or other technology using only their thoughts. According to their findings, the scientists were able to collect brain waves that controlled a mechanical arm. The research team's leader called it a significant achievement for brain science and said it means China's BCI technology ranks among the world's best. 
Some suggest the technology could pose major benefits to humans in the future, like helping people with disabilities, severe injuries, or paralysis regain control of their limbs. It could also allow soldiers to operate weapons or drones hands-free. On the other hand, bridging the gap between mind and machine is raising some concerns, like the potential for cyber attacks, where hackers may intercept and steal brain signal data, or the risk of foreign adversaries getting a military or intelligence advantage. The Department of Commerce is currently reviewing whether exporting BCIs could pose national security concerns. Britain's competition watchdog is launching a review of the artificial intelligence market, including popular chatbots such as ChatGPT. The Competition and Markets Authority said it will look at the opportunities and risks of artificial intelligence. It comes after members of parliament raised concerns about the recent explosion of AI and asked what the government is doing to prevent misuse of the technology. Mr. Speaker, when advances in medical technology uh, around genetic engineering, for example, raise sensitive issues, we have debates on medical ethics, we adapt legislation and put in place robust regulation and oversight. And the explosion in AI potentially poses the same level of moral dilemma and is open to criminal use for fraud, impersonation and by malign players such as the Chinese government, for example. So as leaders in AI, what should the UK be doing to balance safety with opportunity and innovation? Science Secretary Chloe Smith said the government recognizes many technologies can pose a risk when in the wrong hands. She said the UK is working with allies in balance, innovation, and the use of AI based on the values of freedom, fairness, and democracy, and that the government's integrated review of the UK's security and foreign policy recognizes the challenges that are posed by China. When we come back, a grain-surfing robot is helping farmers make sure grain stays fresh. Robots can dive into grain storage and do a job that's otherwise time-consuming and dangerous. And farmers in Morocco work with international scientists to create drought-resistant crops. They have built up quite the seed bank. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. The streaming platform from Shenyun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, and more. Order now and save $100 on annual subscriptions at shenyuncreations.com slash TV. Have you ever considered getting a walk-in tub? Well, look no further. SafeStep's best offer just got better. When you purchase your brand new SafeStep walk-in tub, you'll receive a free shower package. Yes, a free shower package. And if you call today, you'll also receive $1,600 off. Call now to receive a free shower package plus $1,600 off with the purchase of your brand new SafeStep walk-in tub. Welcome back. Irish airline Ryanair is announcing an enormous order for Boeing 737 MAX jets. That's after public criticism delayed talks by 18 months. The ordered jets are the largest in the 737 MAX family. We paid more per seat this time around than we did the last time. Uh, but uh, we're still uh, incredibly happy with the deal we've done. We think the extra seats gives us that kind of revenue earning potential that will help us to pay for these moderately more expensive aircraft. The deal means Ryanair gets 150 new Boeing jets with the option for 150 more. Ryanair said the order would allow it to almost double the number of passengers in fly flights. The MAX 10 is the largest version of Boeing 737 MAX jet at 230 seats. O'Leary said last year broke off talks with Boeing over pricing and delays in the arrival of previously ordered jets. Ryanair is one of Boeing's largest customers. The new jet orders are expected to be delivered from 2027 to 2023.
Spanish police arrest 26 people accused of using illegal wells to grow tropical fruit during the country's drought. The authorities uncovered the forbidden water sources hidden under debris. Authorities have found more than 250 illegal wells, boreholes, and ponds in southern Spanish province, with an estimated damage of $11 million. The investigation has taken four years. Spain is Europe's biggest producer of tropical fruits. But this year, producers estimate that high temperatures and a lack of water will drop avocado production by 25 percent. Spain is currently experiencing one of its worst droughts. The state agency declared this past April as the warmest April since records began in 1961. Now we'll look at a pair of grain surfing robots. The inventor says they could revolutionize grain storage and keep farm workers out of harm's way. This robot can surf across grains of wheat or barley like it's swimming through water. It's great to say it could change the way we store the food we grow and even save lives. An Edinburgh-based startup Crover has designed the robot to give farmers a better look at the environment inside a silo or shed. If it's too hot, it could mean infestations of mold or insects and significant portions of a farmer's crop being destroyed. To get a taste of how the silo's doing, the robot swims in the grain, borrowing itself in the heap and taking measurements for temperature and humidity. We want to take a measurement, we stop, go into penetration mode, and we are ready to deploy the probe. Lorenzo Conti is the inventor of the device. So the main purpose of the robot is to make sure that the same quality of grain that goes into storage is the one that comes out. Hence, helping the likes of farmers, grain merchants, cooperatives and port operators reduce mass and quality losses. Conti says a large bulk grain store can currently take days to sample, while a Crover robot could produce a 3D map of the heap's temperature and moisture levels in a fraction of that time. Crover, which is baked by the UK and Scottish governments, aims to replace traditional processes to check on grain. Doing it manually involves stepping out onto the heap and sampling it with a spear, an often labour-intensive process that is potentially dangerous. The main way of monitoring grain bulks at the moment is still sending a person to physically walk on top of these grain bulks, which is very dangerous to do, because uh, grain entrapment and grain engulfment can be fatal. Uh, and hence, a lot of companies do not do any monitoring or sampling at all because of the dangers involved. Farmers in Morocco are collaborating with a group of international scientists to create drought-resistant crops. They hope it could offset the soaring costs for fuel and fertilizers. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the roots of the partnership. In Morocco, a 2022 drought reduced the country's cereal harvest by almost 70 percent. Half of that crop was soft wheat, the country's main staple. In 2021, Morocco produced more than 11 tons of wheat. Last year, production plunged to just 3.5 tons. According to the country's Institute for Agronomical Research, it was the poorest harvest for 60 years. Since 2004, researchers have been developing more resilient varieties of essential crops. Farmer Slimani Abdallah says this is sorely needed. Expenses for using each hectare of soil have doubled. Everything is more expensive. Fertilizers, insecticides and gas. Farmers are really suffering. The scientists are crossing old seeds with newer varieties, which they've bred to become more disease and drought resistant. The latest crops also have a much higher yield. We have uh, developed uh, varieties of wheat and barley that are more resilient to classical varieties. For example, in the year of drought, these varieties shows a yield of uh, an improved yield of 30 percent compared to the other varieties, the old varieties. Scaling up supply of the new seeds in time for next season is a challenge. The new variants are sent to seed manufacturers in Italy and Spain. Our objective is that the varieties we developed, thanks to our cooperation, reach the Moroccan farmers as soon as possible. Agronomical research places great importance on producing crops in big quantities. The backbone of the program is seed banks in Rabat, Morocco, and Beirut, Lebanon. 
A scientist in Rabat says the seed bank here holds 116,000 varieties, including barley, chickpeas, fava beans, and lentils. The one in Beirut holds 50,000 species. Having so many variants is what enables scientists to innovate by crossbreeding plants with traditional farming techniques. We thank the researchers because they made some new and excellent crops that helped the farmers. These crops are encouraging the farmers to carry on working. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Up next, the Golden State Warriors play the Los Angeles Lakers tomorrow night. An older generation of fans dance to support the Warriors during this year's NBA playoffs. Details to come on NTD News Today. The first NTD Global Chinese Beauty Pageant doesn't only celebrate natural beauty. It also has a mission to educate women about traditional Chinese values. NTD's Arlene Richards spoke with the pageant's honorary advisors to get their thoughts on the pageant's mission. Beauty pageants help women showcase their beauty, both inside and out. The first NTD Global Chinese Beauty Pageant is no exception. Its mission is to educate young Chinese women about their heritage and to instill in them the traditional values of ancient Chinese culture. Alexander Yannick, a leading client advisor and stylist in the high fashion industry, and Jackie Phillips, a celebrity makeup artist, television personality, and author, share their thoughts on the pageant's mission. I feel like the values is like the overall arch of it all, which is the most important thing. I love that it's about traditions. You know, we're losing traditions in this world, and they're so important. Having wisdom, and that's the inner wisdom, you know, and trusting that, and kindness. I mean, though, all those things is what sets this pageant apart. There's, I don't think there's anything like it in the world. The pageant will challenge contestants to use their beauty for a higher purpose by extolling these five inner virtues, morality, righteousness, propriety, benevolence, and faithfulness. Phillips said beauty comes from the heart. I think using your words kindly and positively can make you the most beautiful person in the world. Contestants will be evaluated based on their responses to judges' questions, their evening gown and national costume presentations, and their creative talents. This is a new generation. I really want to see them, uh, not just uh, out, uh, out, you know, outside, but I love to see more inside, really deep. And, and I think this, we can look at not just the beauty, but again, intelligent, wisdoms, knowledge, and uh, I want to see them, you know, growing to show new generation it's not just the beauty, but, but so much they can offer. It. The grand prize winner will be crowned Miss NTD and receive a $10,000 cash prize, a sapphire and diamond encrusted tiara, and a selection of fine jewelry and designer dresses. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The Golden State Warriors are trying to hold on to their spot in the NBA Western Conference Finals, but NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details on another team performing on basketball's biggest stage. An older generation of fans are cheering on the Golden State Warriors during this year's NBA playoffs. They're dancing to pump up Dub Nation. You can't believe what it's like. Are you, it's unbelievable the, just to be able to they're happy, we're happy, everybody's happy. Sometimes they start cheering before we even get started and we can't hear the music. All of the members of the Hardwood Classics dance group are 55 or older. I love hanging out and uh, love the rehearsals and I love the attitudes of, of everybody. I mean, they have the same thing. They all want to contribute somehow. They performed on Monday night during the Western Conference semifinals game four. Normally they perform on the court, but the Warriors were away at the Los Angeles Lakers. So the team performed outside for hundreds of fans at the Chase Center in San Francisco. As they say, eight is just a number. You can dance, you can dance good. Anyone can, can join the team. 
And that's what's nice. I mean, it gives people all opportunities because you've seen young kids dance. You've seen people my age dance. You see people like my, my mom's age dance too. That's just awesome to see. They were great and they look really good. I think they did a great job and props to them for being their age and coming out and having fun. Joanna joined the group five years ago for the inaugural season. Her only dance experience was as a jazzercise instructor. Well, I think what I like the most about it, I love the dancing and the performing, but it's being with this group of people. I never thought I could get so attached <laughs> to people so fast. Joanna fondly remembers the fans' love and support during her first year. In a group like that, and everybody was having such a, such a great time, and the audience were so crazy. They were so appreciative, and they were just yelling, and it was just fabulous. The Warriors need to come back from a 3-1 deficit in the series to make it to the Western Conference Finals. The dancers will see if they can help the reigning NBA champions win another title. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. An antelope that escaped a zoo in Massachusetts is back home with her mate after five weeks on the run. Mary escaped from Lupa Zoo on April 1st after a storm damaged a fenced enclosure. She has only one horn because of a birth defect. Local and state law enforcement officials helped zoo staff in the search. A dedicated zoo worker named Wally Lupa brought her back in safely. He said her species only needs about 10 minutes of sleep at a time and is resilient to tranquilizers. Mary was spotted Saturday and he got her to walk into a trailer. She was reunited with her mate Sunday morning and will be slowly settling back in at the zoo. Lupa said before being captured, she was seen with several deer who she apparently made friends with along the way. The zookeeper had been mostly sleeping in his car during the five week search. He said he was looking forward to finally sleeping in his own bed. Thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to share any news tips or feedback for the show, please feel free to email us at news.today at ntd.com. I'm Chris Beers, and you're watching NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.